And all, please stand and greet one another, passing the peace of Christ to your neighbors. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, if you could please find your seats, and we will now prepare our hearts to worship. Please join me in the call to worship as is written in your bulletin. Return to the Lord your God, for God is righteous. Confess to the Lord your God, for God is merciful. Repent to the Lord your God, Praise the Lord your God. Worship the Lord your God. Amen.
please remain standing and join me in the affirmation of faith written in your hymnal on page 881 if you need that. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray. Almighty God, you are gracious, clothed in majesty. You are mighty, yet you save us with mercy. Almighty God, you are an exquisite creator with hands that carve out beauty. You are the author of life, yet you give us such freedom. Indeed, for reasons that only you can understand, you gave us the tremendous gift of free will. Help us to use that gift in a way that reflects your perfect love for the world and for our fellow human beings, and forgive us when we misuse it to hurt each other by using each other for our own selfish purposes. Almighty God, you know each of us intimately. Your heart is full of love, yet you watch over us in our weaknesses and guide us daily. Prince of Peace, we draw near to you and drink in the promise of eternity. Lord of peace, we walk with you and seek your guidance as we learn to be more loving. Lord of peace, in this your sanctuary, we are safe, safe to let down our guard and dwell in your truth. Lord, as we celebrate this day that you have made and gifted to us, help us to be ever mindful that you came for the needy, the poor, the oppressed, the forsaken, and those whom society has forgotten. In that spirit, Lord, we beseech you to guide all of our political leaders. We pray that you would give them both discernment and wisdom. Discernment to fully appreciate the seriousness of the task before them, and wisdom to address themselves to those tasks in a way that will both honor and elevate the common good of all humanity. Lord, your life renews our hearts from within, and we thank you that we carry your promise of forgiveness. Lord, we ask for your spirit to work through us as we minister to the world and share your love with all. Almighty God, Prince of Peace, risen Lord, we dedicate our lives to you by praying the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Front for the children's talk. Yeah. 
Would the ushers please come forward to accept God's tithes and our offerings? be seated if you haven't already. Oh. 
Wasn't that a beautiful anthem? Thank you, choir. I think we can give them a round of applause. Let us pray. Lord, as we come before you this morning, please grant that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts and minds will be acceptable in your sight. In your holy name we pray. Amen. The Old Testament lesson today is from the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 12, verses 1 through 15. And the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man, <clears throat> excuse me, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb which he had bought. And he brought it up, and it grew up with him and his children. And he used it to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him, but he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who did this should die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing, because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. And I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your bosom, and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord, and done what is evil in his sight? You have smitten Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and have taken his wife to be your wife. You have slain him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me and taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before Israel and before the sun. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord, and Nathan said to David, the Lord has put away your sin, you shall not die. Nevertheless, because you did this deed and utterly scorned the Lord, the child that is born to you shall die. And then Nathan went to his house. And then the gospel lesson from Luke's gospel, chapter 22, beginning with verse 54. And I would invite you to stand for the reading of the gospel. Then they seized Jesus and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. Peter followed at a distance, and when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. Then a maid, seeing him as he sat in the light and gazing at him, said, This man also was with him, but he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, You are also one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, Certainly this man was with him, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are saying. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the cock crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the cock crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. In both its Old and New Testament iterations, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. These lessons that we have just shared together represent pivotal events in the lives of two towering figures of the Bible. As a matter of fact, to describe these two men, David and Peter, as towering figures probably doesn't adequately capture it. Because I think it would be fair to say, and I think a very strong argument could be made for the proposition that without David and without Peter, the Judeo-Christian tradition that we worship in and adhere to today might well not exist. I mean, let's just consider for a moment who these two men were. First of all, David. David was the great king of Israel who established Israel with secure borders for the first time, who established its capital at Jerusalem, and above all, who was the progenitor of the line of Jesus Christ. Because as we all know from the Christmas story, Jesus was of the house and lineage of David. And then there's Peter, 
According to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 19, what did Jesus say about Peter? He said, bless you, Simon Bar-Jonah. You are the rock upon which I will build my church. And then the New Testament, commenting on David in Acts chapter 13, verses 21 through 33, says this about David. Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up David, their king, whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart who will do all my will. So on the one hand, we have David, the progenitor of the line of Jesus Christ and the man after God's own heart. And on the other hand, we have Peter, the rock upon which the church was going to be built and was built. Yet what did they do? These two great paragons of our faith messed up, and they messed up badly. What did Peter do? Well, when the chips got down, he denied Jesus three times in rapid succession to try to save his own skin. And what did David do? Well, the Old Testament lesson that I read to you is sort of a culmination of what's been happening in the book of 2 Samuel since chapter 11. It's the story of David and Bathsheba. I think most of us are familiar with it. He sees Bathsheba. He lusts after her. He takes her. He has a child by her. And then he concocts a scheme, what we would call a political cover-up today, to try to cover what he did. And when her husband Uriah the Hittite won't go along with this cover-up, he has him killed. And he has him killed in a very treacherous way. He doesn't just outright kill him. He tells his general to take Uriah back to the front and send him on a suicide mission to get rid of him. And so David takes a woman, has an illegitimate child with her, and has her husband killed when he won't go along with the cover-up. And Peter looks at the Lord of Lords, Emmanuel, God with us, and says, I don't know you. That's about as bad as you can mess up. That's about as badly as you can do. Now, what does this mean? Well, the fact that Peter and David are essentially bookends of the saga of our faith, the progenitor of the line of Christ and the rock upon which the church was built, and yet they messed up so badly, gives us the heart of our message today. And that message is an antidote to the spiritual afflictions that separate us from each other and from God. And it tells us in no uncertain terms that despite all of our sins and all of our shortcomings, that are part and parcel of what it means to be human, there's hope for us anyway. Despite all of the problems that we have and despite all of the things we bring on ourselves, there is hope for us anyway. You know, I've taught a lot of Sunday school classes in this church and there's a a sort of a, a trope, sort of an idea that I use in a lot of those Sunday school lessons to describe the frailties of the human condition that we're all afflicted with. I call them the four F's. We as human beings are frail, we are fallible, we are finite, and we have feet of clay. And because we are frail, we are fallible, we are finite, and have feet of clay, we are subject to all the frailties of the human condition and all of the problems and screw-ups of the human condition that both David and Peter fell victim to. Yet, in spite of all of that, there is hope for us anyway. Because remember, when Peter did what he did and when David did what he did, God did not put them away. What did he do? He forgave them and then harnessed those frailties for his own purpose and did something great with both of them. With David, it was the kingdom of Israel and the start of the line that ultimately resulted in Jesus Christ. And with Peter, it was the rock upon which the church was built. And so what does that say to us? That tells us that there is hope for us anyway. As frail as we are, as problematic as our behavior is to both each other and to God on many occasions and in many cases, there's hope for us anyway because we have the grace of a loving God who can do for us what he also did for David and for Peter. And if we'll just realize that, if we will just allow ourselves to 
to buy in to that central idea that underwrites the relationship between God and humanity, then it can serve as an antidote to a lot of the spiritual afflictions that separate us both from each other and from God. And so what are some of those spiritual afflictions that separate us from each other and from God? Well, one of those afflictions is commonly known as the dark night of the soul. That term, the dark night of the soul, was originally coined by a 16th century Spanish poet and mystic named St. John of the Cross. And what it's come to be understood as in, in modern times is a place where all of us are at from time to time, if we're honest, where we feel like that because of what we have done or who we are or the extent to which we've fallen victim to our shortcomings and our frailties, we are simply separated from God. How could God love me? As vile as I am, as much as I've failed, as much as I've messed up, as much as I have done wrong, how could I even be close to God, let alone be used by him for any good purpose? That's the dark night of the soul. And this idea that God is there and loves us, and because of that there's hope for us anyway, is the ultimate antidote to that dark night of the soul in which we all find ourselves from time to time. <clears throat> then there's the opposite of the dark night of the soul, and that is false spiritual superiority. And if St. John of the Cross coined the idea of the dark night of the soul, then the false spiritual superiority trope or sort of representative is the church lady. Remember the church lady? The Dana Carvey character from Saturday Night Live? <clears throat> When Dana Carvey did that character, he was parodying an idea that some people have about their own sense of spiritual or moral superiority, and it deserves to be parodied. Because I'm here to tell you folks, anytime any of us feel that we have any sense of moral or spiritual superiority over anybody else, it is a false idea. Because we are all capable of messing up. If David is capable of messing up the way he messed up, if Peter is capable of messing up the way he messed up, then we are all capable of messing up, and none of us are in a position to assert any sense of spiritual superiority or moral superiority over anybody else. Both the dark night of the soul and any sense of spiritual superiority are meaningless, as are all of the other walls that we set up to separate us from each other and from the love of God. And that means this. There are no liberal Christians, there are no conservative Christians, there are no Bible-believing Christians, there are no interpretive Christians, there are only broken and hurting Christians. Broken and hurting people in desperate need of the love and grace of a sustaining and loving God. We are all broken sinners in need of that grace, nothing more, nothing less. And the quicker we realize that, and the quicker we embrace that idea, then the better off we will be. So what do we need to do? What do we need to do in order to take advantage of this tremendous gift of love and grace that God is willing to give us? You know, David and Peter both embraced it. And by embracing it, they overcame the tremendous sins that they had committed in order to rise to the level that God would have them rise to. So how do we embrace it? How do we accept this tremendous grace and love of which we all stand in such tremendous need? Well, that's something you could write books about. You could write volumes about. You could talk about that for days or weeks or months or years. But given the limited time we have here today, I would like to suggest three strategies. Three things that we can do in order to begin to realize who we are as broken sinners and to accept the love of God and the grace that comes with it that we need is that spiritual antidote to the dark night of the soul and the false sense of spiritual superiority and all of the other things that separate us from each other and from God. The first thing I'd like to suggest is that we need to commit to a spirit of radical inclusion. 
We need to commit to a spirit of radical inclusion because all of us are broken, all of us are sinners, all of us are hurting, therefore all of us need to be invited to the table. Now you notice I used the word radical there and I did that very purposely. This inclusion that we need to commit to is an inclusion that is radical, meaning that in some cases it may make us uncomfortable. In fact, unless it's making us uncomfortable sometimes, then the spirit of inclusion I'm talking about is probably not radical enough. And I was glad to see in a very enlightening article I read in the state newspaper earlier this week that our conference, the South Carolina United Methodist Conference, is moving in that direction of radical inclusion. We're not there yet. Might not ever be totally there. Might always have improvements we can make and steps along the journey that we can take. But it's heartening to see that we are headed in that right direction. And I want to give you three examples. These are three resolutions that were adopted by the United Methodist Conference at the annual conference that just ended in Greenville that were reported in the state newspaper. First, delegates to the conference voted to approve a resolution that explicitly states LGBTQ youth are included in the church as part of all at-risk youth. Several people opposed to the amendment said it shouldn't be necessary to say both phrases, but others said that specific acknowledgement would open all the church's doors to people who may not otherwise believe they are welcome, even with the language of all. Amen. That's radical inclusion. And I was glad to see our church commit to it in such a formal way. Secondly, Trinity United Methodist Church in Charleston apologized to Centenary United Methodist Church to start making amends for racial discrimination that led black members to form their own church. Again, a tremendous step towards radical inclusion because until we bring healing, we can't embrace the kind of inclusion that I'm talking about, and that is a step on the road to healing. And then thirdly, the conference approved a resolution which expresses support for immigrants and calls on policy leaders to develop comprehensive immigration reform. Those are three resolutions that were adopted at the conference that I think heads us in that direction of inclusion. But as much as what the conference did, what they refused to do is indicative of that spirit of radical inclusion as well. Here's something they refused to do. The Reverend Keith Sweat, who retired from Aware Shoals Church this week, attempted Wednesday to bring back his proposal to sever the state conference from the greater United Methodist Church over a lot of policy disagreements, mainly in the LGBTQ area. That was voted down. <coughs> Excuse me. Mr. Sweat's view of radical exclusivity as opposed to inclusivity was formally repudiated by the conference. So the conference distinguished itself as much by what it refused to endorse as what it endorsed. And in both ways, it showed that we were moving in that direction of radical inclusion that we need to head in. So committing to radical inclusion, the second thing we need to do is to reach out to each other in the spirit of healing. Realizing that we are not separated by anything, we are only joined by our common humanity and the frailties that that impose that stand us in need of the grace of a loving God. The Apostle Paul captured that idea pretty cogently in his letter to the church at Colossae, the book of Colossians, chapter 3, verses 11 through 17, where he said this, here there cannot be Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian and Scythian, slave, free man, but Christ is all in all. Put on then as, God chose, as God's chosen ones, holy, beloved compassion, kindness, lowliness, meekness, and patience, forbearing one another, and if one has a complaint, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all, Put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called to the one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, and sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And in whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to the Father through him. <coughs> So, commit to a spirit of radical inclusion, reach out to each other in a spirit of healing, and then once we've done that, we can move on to the third point. 
which is work together to build each other and the church up. And that's something that we are all going to be immediately challenged to do. Because in a couple of weeks, we're going to be welcoming a new minister here, Reverend Joseph James and his wife, Reverend Kathy James. As the chair of the staff parish committee this year, I've gotten an opportunity to get to know Reverend James very well. And folks, he's ready to hit the ground running here. He is ready to come to us and minister to us to help us build each other up and build this church up, but he cannot do it alone. Nobody could do it alone. He needs the committed support of all of us, both as individuals and as a body of Christ and a body of the church, in order to do what needs to be done to build each other up and to build this church up. And therein lies the challenge. Because until we have accepted this idea that we are all equal in our brokenness, all equal in our hurting, all equal in our afflictions that come with the human condition, we'll never be able to commit the spiritual, physical, moral energy that we need to commit in order to do what needs to be done to build each other up and to build this church up and to be the supportive congregation that we need to be for Reverend James when he gets here. But if we can do it, the rewards are great. The rewards are tremendous. And probably the best summary of those rewards was stated by the prophet Isaiah in his book, chapter 58, verses 9 through 12, where he said this, Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you take away from the midst of you the yoke, the pointing of the finger, and speaking wickedness, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness, and your gloom be as noonday, and the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire with good things and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters fail not, and your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. Folks, that's what we need to be known as. We need to be known as repairers of the breach, as the restorer of streets to dwell in. From my knowledge of him, I think Joseph James already is. But as I said, he can't do it alone. We need to join with him so we can all work together collectively to do those things that we need to do so that we can all be called repairers of the breach and the restorer of streets to live in. If we can fight that good fight of trying to do these things, then just like there was for David and Peter, in spite of all of the spiritual and physical afflictions that are visited on us by virtue of our being human, there's hope for us anyway. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
In the spirit of radical inclusion and healing love, please receive the benediction. Let us pray. May the road rise up to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face and the rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.